Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number five of our Coolio Cast, Coolio Podcast. Uh, again, <laughs> it's exciting to be five episodes in. I'm going to start out again just again by welcoming everyone and letting you know that we do have t-shirts, we have hats, we have water bottles, we have masks, we have gators, all on the merch store there. So if you're in Twitch and you guys are watching now, just click on the link, clink, click on the link below. Go ahead and browse and check them out. Uh, those purchases will definitely help benefit the stream and also benefit the podcast. So if that is something that interests you, please do that as well. Now moving on to our topic today, Living History Gettysburg and what it means to us. Featuring living historian MJ Hennion, who is known as Major Cushman, and we also have John Ruse with us tonight, historian from the Fredericksburg area. Hello, everyone. We are on the podcast now. John and MJ, or otherwise known as Major Cushman, say hello. Why, good evening, everyone. How are you all doing tonight? <laughs> hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. And Michael Hardy from North Carolina comes in and says, evening, friends. So hello to you, Michael. Hi, Michael. Hi. How are you? Wow. Heavy hitters. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, tonight's topic is really exciting, I think. We're going to really be talking about living history, a little bit about Gettysburg, and what the Civil War history means to us. And uh, with our guest tonight, I would like to start with Major Cushman and actually have her introduce herself and really talk about kind of her position in Civil War history and what she does in the realm of living history. So, Major Cushman, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Well, thank you so kindly for having me on, gentlemen. Uh, of course, in the history community, my name is Miss Major Pauline Cushman, Union Spy. Uh, in the 21st century, my name is MJ Henge, and I portray Pauline in Living History. I'm a part of the Living History Group, the Confederation of Union Generals. I've been playing uh, Ms. Cushman uh, for a couple of years now, and I really enjoy it. Uh, I was interested in history from a young age, kind of caught the bug when I was about eight years old. My mother got me a book called Lee and Grant at Appomattox. The following year, my school had a special ancestry day and one of my classmates brought in a uniform from his ancestor who served in one of the New York units during the war. And I still remember the feel of the uniform, the smell of it. And this is, this was okay. I'm going to date myself. I'm a little bit, I, I, it was about 40 years ago, but I was yes. enthralled. And ever since then, I have been a big nut about civil war history. Now I'm, I live upside of uh, Albany, New York. Uh, and of course we're revolutionary war territory. Battle of Saratoga and such. And I, I've always been into all kinds of history, but I never really caught the bug for Revolutionary War. Uh, I did, though, with Civil War history. I got a chance to visit Gettysburg for the first time in 2008. I fell in love with the place and just really started to be more of a student of Civil War history and study the battle. I got into living history a few years ago. Uh, one of my really good friends, he was like a brother to me. Unfortunately, he passed away in July. Uh, his name is Randy Fairnack. He portrayed Gen uh, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock in my group. And I was uh, friends with him. I met him through one of the groups actually on Facebook um, that I admin actually now. And we became fast friends and he introduced me to his group. And we started talking about, you know, me taking the step. I mean, getting into living history is a big commitment. Uh, there's a lot of study, a lot of research. It's not a very cheap hobby to get into either, I will say. Oh, I know. I believe that. <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> it is expensive. And you have to kind of build your kit over time, uh, which I have done. And it is a big time commitment with travel. Uh, of course, being I'm in upstate New York, most of our events are in Pennsylvania and, and Virginia and such. So it's it's a lot of travel and 
you know, you pay for all of your own stuff, all of your own lodging, all of your own meals. And, and it's a it's an unpaid gig, I should say, monetarily. But when you're able to bring history to life for people that come to these events, either in person or I try to do a lot of stuff online, too, that that's the payment when you can inspire somebody, when you can, you know, get them interested in history, maybe more than they were. Uh, so that's that's why I do. So I do living history with them. Uh, I also admin a few Facebook groups of for Civil War in Gettysburg on Facebook. Uh, so that's that's pretty much where my niche in, in the in the Civil War community is right now, and I'm always looking to build on that and expand. I think that's really cool that you also have that tangible link to your interest in history when you were mentioning that you had the book given to you by your mom and then you know you also had a classmate bring in that uniform that alone is something i find with a lot of people that have this depth of interest when it comes to the civil war is that there's always some sort of tangible link that really brings it to life for them if that makes any sense i know for my sake uh, my father gave me a copy of the centennial handbook so i'm along the same lines as you with a prayer and passing down a book to you Mm -hmm. And um, that book itself had a picture of some of the soldiers that were killed with Yule's Corps out at Spotsylvania Courthouse. Now, growing up in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and actually technically in Spotsylvania County, I live maybe a stone's throw away from that field, which would be known as the Harris Farm. I'm just right across the street from that actual place that this picture was depicting. And at a young age, you know, five or six years old, you're automatically kind of wondering how something like that could happen. And that was really what skyrocketed me into wanting to know more and continuing on this path of studying the Civil War and even getting into living history later on in life. But I completely understand. I think it's really cool, too, that you have that tangible collect, you know, connection with the Civil War. Uh, it was, it was, it was, like I said, I can still remember the smell of the uniform. Yeah. He had the sword. Um, his ancestor was injured at, uh, I think it was Chancellorsville, if I have to remember right. And oh, no actually, kidding. He actually had the, piece, the the gentleman save the piece of the shell fragment. Oh, wow. That hit him. So we were touching all of that, and it was just, oh, to me, it man. was just one of the coolest things I've ever experienced in my entire life. No, and absolutely. Really and especially um, when and it's it, from that the Civil War itself, not just, you know, an after book that was posted, you know, maybe the 60s, but something like that from the war. I know. That, I know. Cool. It was just, it was one of those, you can you can feel it and touch it. Uh, over the years, I tried researching to see if I had any ancestors because I right. always I have some sort of connection to Gettysburg because it's my favorite battlefield. I've been to some other ones, but it's always my go to. And a few years ago, I actually did find that two of my paternal ancestors fought on Culp's Hill. Oh, no kidding. With the 145th New York. 145th New York. There were two brothers. And now now here's the funny thing, because when I was a kid, I was also drawn to Robert E. Lee. And I always respected both sides and wanted to research both sides of the battle. Absolutely. And the funny thing is, is when, you know, a lot of my friends were like, they used to call me the New York Rev. You know, it was, it was a funny <laughs> thing. Because I had, you know, I, li I respected Lee and, and Longstreet and Jeb Stewart. Of course, they're great and generals in their own right. Who, you know, yes. can't fault you for that at all. And I could never, you know, they were always figure. They're trying to figure it out. And even the guys in my living history group were like, "We don't understand this." And then when I found out about these paternal ancestors, there were two of them. One of them actually got wounded in 1864. They both survived the Battle of Gettysburg. Then okay. They, they continued on their Civil War uh, journey, and in, one of them in 1864 got wounded again, and he had just had enough. He had just had enough. He ended up actually leaving the Union Army and moved to Virginia and then served with the Confederacy. What? Oh. <laughs> wow. And then when I said, you know, when I made this discovery and shared it, they said, oh, that's why. <laughs> so wow. it's very strange. It's... It, it, so I was very pleased to find that I did have ancestors at Gettysburg, and I always pay homage to them up on Culp's Hill, which, you know, is often a, a forgotten part of the battle over there Absolutely. on the right flank of the Union. Mm -hmm. You know, you think July 2nd, everybody automatically brings up Chamberlain and Little Round Top. Of course, 
Most of us in the movie Gettysburg back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's often a place that is not as well visited. It should be. They're actually going to be doing some uh, restoration work up there. They're going to be removing a lot of the trees and putting in walking trails and new waysides. Good. So I'm about that. Well, I'm excited to hear that. Yeah, I think they're starting that this spring, I believe. Well, I always find Culp's Hill is actually one of the coolest places to go when I go to Gettysburg. I really enjoy going up to even the tower up there and being able to see Mm -hmm. the the view of the entirety of the town and beyond is, I mean, that's something itself, just visiting Culp's Hill. But you're right, it's not very visited and it's not very much a highly sought after point of study anymore. And I think it should be because a lot of the important (coughs) fighting does take place on Culp's Hill, including some entrenchments. And I'm an entrenchment nut. I yep, love going around and see, oh yeah, and being able to see that and some of the burial pits <clears throat> that still are on Culp's Hill. I mean, that's a draw for me. But again, everybody isn't as much of a nut into entrenchments as myself. So I can understand <laughs> why they're not going out there, but yeah. I think I, the new restoration is going to open up a lot of study of that part of the battle because it's really not visitor friendly No, the way the way it is. You can't, unless you go in the dead of winter time, you really can't see the terrain that well. You know, see what the soldiers saw back in July of 1863. So, I, the restoration that they're going to be doing and 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 everything that's going to be, I think, is going to help people understand and introduce another part of the battle to them. Sure, and I mean that's something I think that's important too is to bring a lot of attention to some of those lesser known portions of the battlefield, if you will. Uh, one of my favorite places too. I don't know if you're familiar with a lot of the artillery at Gettysburg, but I myself had an ancestor. And I don't know if I've been able to share this story with you or not. But as a fellow Gettysburg aficionado, I think you should definitely hear this. I have a Confederate ancestor in Parker's Virginia Battery, and he is quoted to have fired the last shot of Gettysburg. As crazy and wow, how can you back that up? Well. I have a letter that was returned from James Longstreet from my ancestor asking if he remembered this event happening, and Longstreet does return very short and curt reply. He just says, yes, I remember the events referred to in this paper, and then sends it back, and that's short, sweet, and that's to the point. But I'm knowing James Longstreet. Exactly. I was going to say, <laughs> I'm glad that it wasn't some lengthy, oh, yeah, Duffy, I remember you. Yes, you fired. It was just that short, sweet, hey, there's the epitome of James Longstreet in that letter. But having that tangible, you know, that item, and it's not obviously in my hands. That's something that's in the Library of Congress. But knowing that it's there and having access to that and then being able to go out to the battlefield and stand where he stood or be around the artillery battery that he was at and try to picture what it was like on day two defending the the area around the Peach Orchard because he's directly assaulting Peach Orchard with his battery. In fact, might even be responsible for Sickles' leg. I'm not 100% sure on that, but just his position and the fact that he was firing on the Trossel Barn always wants me to believe that he may or may not have... Oh, man, me and Sickles have a rough history. We'll, we'll just leave Poor it Poor Dan. I know. I know, because I, I used to really just have this bitter nastiness towards Sickles, and the more I read James Hessler's stuff on Sickles and even the uh, Gettysburg Peach Orchard book, I started finding out I have this sort of mild respect and admiration for Dan, and I'm don't know what came over me and made me have that, but as much of a scoundrel as he is, we we thank him for the well, Gettysburg no, battlefield. Nobody's perfect, all right? No, they're not. <laughs> Certainly not Mr. Sickles, but you got to respect the temporary insanity plea. I mean, hey, he's... He... <laughs> oh, there was nothing temporary about that. No, there's <laughs> not. <laughs> Actually, the gentleman in my living history group, John Griffiths, he portrays Dan Sickles. Yeah. And if you ever get a chance to see our program and him, he is Dan Sickles. He, oh, man. It's like you're just talking to him. He is so knowledgeable. He's got – it's just amazing. And he is – he really brings Sickles to life for folks on our program. So if you ever awesome. get a chance to check out one of our things, please do, because he is phenomenal. Well, once this COVID mess is over, I would absolutely love to. I mean, I make frequent trips to Gettysburg myself, so if I find out you guys are up there at all, I know my regiment's going to be up uh, doing some stuff at the Lady Farm this year when we can. So I don't know if you guys are coming out to any events we do there. Well, we're scheduled to be in Unity Park for the anniversary July 1st through 4th. Uh, oh, okay. We have a, um, if that doesn't pan out, 
because of the school and things like that, I think mm-hmm. we might be going to Daniel Lady Farms event. So sweet. Well, either way, I'll be in there. The yeah, we'll see each other there. I'll be in uniform. Yeah. I might be in be in gray, but we'll see each other. I'll, I can be a prisoner well, for a day. Well, that's all right because you know Miss <laughs> Cushman. She she had, she liked the Southern gentleman actually. All right. Uh, she was asked for her hand in marriage by Joan Hunt Morgan, who oh, got tired wow. of chasing her. He he captured her twice and she escaped. <laughs> so he gave up and they became friends actually. And no uh, he actually ended up asking her to marry him. Wow. Which she declined. Uh, but I do find that very funny. That um, is funny. One of the things, too, about why I do living history. Now, I portray Major Pauline Cushman uh, in her military aspect. Uh, she was given a uh, commission of major for her spying work for the Union Army down in the uh, Western Theater. That's where she was. She had been at Gettysburg. There would have even been a battle, you know. She would have just taken care of it all. But, <laughs> but I betray her and her military aspect because it's an unconventional role that I think, and and a lot of women don't get the respect they should in Civil War history um, because many people think of women in the Civil War and they think of nurses. They think of um, you know, traditional roles, wash women, right. uh, you know, they don't realize that there were spies, there were scouts, there were also women on both sides that hid their gender and fought in the ranks. There's actually a woman documented in William Hay- General William Hayes' report after the Battle of Gettysburg that there was a female color bearer on the Confederacy who died at the Stone Wall. So... I do it, too, to show that women do have a role in Civil War history that was more than, you know, a traditional role. And I do it in living history, too, because a lot of times I even face it still many times of a lot of people in the in the Civil War community. They don't like me being in a uniform. Really? They think that it's not, oh, I, I have fought this since I entered and I was told it was going to happen. Um, I've had a lot of guys come up to me and tell me to go to stop playing and to go uh, cook some food and drink my tea. And what? Food. Yes, I have faced a lot of a lot of persecution in the Civil War community because of how I portray Cushman. Well, I was going to ask you if there was any flag or it. any type of stuff like that that would oh, take yes. place, but that... I believe it. I definitely believe it. <clears throat> oh yes. Oh, it's- and it's unfortunate. I mean, very I've much had so. Organizers. I've even had organizers of an event. Not one to let me come with my living history group as Major Cushman. They wanted me in her civilian role because they didn't believe I should be on the field in a uniform. My God. And my living history group stood behind me and they said, well, we're not doing the event then. You know, it's, it's very unfortunate that still I faced it since day one and I'm still here. I'm still going to be here. I, um, I don't let it detour me at all. And I, there's many times where I do events and little girls will come up to me and they think it's so cool that I'm in a uniform and they hear about Pauline's story. And the greatest, one of the greatest things I receive back is when I have kids come up to me and that they do is after they hear our program and they, you know, talk to me, they're Googling Pauline Cushman and they're wanting to research her more or research a, a battle or something like that. But I've had many little girls as well as their parents come up to me and they say that that's an inspiration for them, that they can do anything they want to do. And that's what I tell them. I said, you can be anything you want to be. So that's also why I portray her in a military role. Now I also do portray her in a civilian role um, for her exploits after the war, but I, I do receive a lot of flack still. And also from some women too. Because it's not, I also get it from women because it's not traditional. Right. I mean, they just, they can't, I guess, see that this is something that's completely acceptable in today's, I mean, that, that's sad that you have to go through that. It's something you have to have. I was told by my mentor, Randy, you know, when I first got into it, he said, mm-hmm. you're going to have to have a thick skin. And I said, that's fine. I'm not a woman who is easily offended either. So. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I even still face it to this day. Uh, most of the people, though, that I know are very supportive, right. and I, I am thankful for that, and I'm blessed by that. 
but there are still the folks that I meet um, that just have a problem with it. They, they, they're, you know, they tell me to go cook them some breakfast and, you know, go put on a dress and to stop playing fantasy. <laughs> well, Pauline Cushman had a major important part in this history and the fact that they are not willing to see that is kind of sad because they're ignoring the fact that you're giving off, you know, the impression of that. You're being able to go out there as Pauline Cushman as his persona and teach what she did. They're not willing to obviously sit and listen to it. So it's, you know, they're not even well, worth the time at that point. You know, that's right, too. I, I think that in also researching her, I found I'm very similar. Her and I have a lot of similar personality traits. And, and my living history group has a thing where we feel that the persona picks the person to portray them in our group. And once I started really researching her, I found we have very similar personality. Uh, you know, we like hanging out with the guys, playing cards, drinking whiskey. <laughs> That's, you know, and she faced a lot of uh, things in her life, too. She didn't have a perfect life. And at the time when I started getting into this, um, I was in an abusive marriage with my ex-husband. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And mm -hmm. Well, I don't call myself a victim. I'm a survivor because I was like actually re researching her. I found out well, she was married three times and the third husband was abusive towards her. Mm. And he was a sheriff, too. So it's mm. and, and of course, you're thinking this is the 1870s, you know, so she just up and left him. She had had enough. She just up and left him and went out on her own. And that was an amazing amount of courage. And that inspired me to do the same thing here in the 21st century. So she has had such a profound impact on my life that she will never ever know, uh, but that's what she's brought to my life. So her and I have a lot of similar characteristic traits, personality, uh, which, you know, that's what I feel. I think, you know, I believe what my living history group believes that the persona picks you. I agree with that. I think absolutely it does. No matter where you're at, you know, even if it's down to the regiment, um, that I think the persona definitely, you have to fit the persona to play the part. And you think you're right when you say it picks you. You don't really go after it. Because I've been in many different, you know, regiments, whether it's down to just park service or whether it, you know, being by choice and falling in with the 12th, the 12th just felt like home immediately. Mm -hmm. And that was really cool. The guys that I'm with are wonderful. Um, it sucks that I've only been able to do a Zoom meeting with uh, most of them. But my main friend, Dan, uh, we met through the uh, train, actually. He's one of the conductors on the VRE that I ride every single day. And one of my other friends that's a conductor there, he introduced us one day and said, y'all are going to be best friends. Watch. I'm just telling you. Y'all like the same stuff. Oh, yeah. A year later, we're in the same regiment and we go to the battlefields together a lot of the times and just go and walk and you know try to bounce ideas and just some of the histories that we learn off each other because that's what us history nuts do and you know it's it's cool to meet people like that and have that connection when there's not a lot of us out there that have a huge love for history like this and go to the point of you know doing living history and then to find other students connect to that field there's just a, i think a stronger connection and a bond between the friendships that are formed there than just your average friendships the run-of-the-mill ones if you know what i'm saying there it's oh I, it's great i agree I agree. I've met some wonderful people in the Civil War community, uh, either uh, online, uh, and then eventually we'll meet in person or, or, or in person. And, uh, you know, I've met some wonderful people, and I'm very blessed to have them in my life, from uh, fellow students of the battle to licensed battlefield guys, uh, authors, uh, you know, things like that. I've also, also met some really interesting people, too. Oh, of course. <laughs> I, I, yes, the, the good major does have quite the following, and uh, <laughs> I've met some interesting folks too. Um, but overall, it's, it's made a very good impact on my life and a positive as well. Oh, that's good. Now, John, do you have uh, some questions? I'm sure too. You, we haven't heard a lot from you. I'd like to get a lot of your take on some I, of this stuff too. I've been uh, just the story was incredible, so I've just been taking in the entire story. So. Uh, actually, some of the one of my questions was uh, already answered about what it's like to see little girls when you're at these uh, events and what they think of you. And it's great to hear that, you know, the inspiration that you give out 
two little girls to think that, hey, there's a whole world in the Civil War community that I can be a part of. And that's just uh, right. really right. wonderful. And I think that your story alone, and I know like you don't get into your personal story when you're doing living history, but the fact that you know it wasn't your dad, it was your mom gave you this book you know, from a mother to a daughter. And I think that's just amazing just to see how that from a female perspective just grew. And uh, I think the whole thing is inspirational and it brings new stories to life that people don't know. It's it's outside of the box thinking, even though it shouldn't be outside of the box thinking because it, the women's role in the Civil War was pivotal mm-hmm. beyond just the hoop skirt. <laughs> and, um, you know... And, when uh when you first were getting into eight years old you get this book you see this uniform were you just thinking like soldiers i want to be a soldier or were you curious about what were you already thinking like what were girls doing what were women i don't know where your mindset would have been at eight years old but you know like what were girls doing during the civil war like did you wonder if they were in uniform or not oh yes absolutely uh I, when I first read the book, I got very interested in Grant and Lee, and that's what kind of started it. And then I would, you know, this was back at the time I grew up in the, you know, late 70s into 80s. I was, you know, I was born in 73. So this is before Google <laughs> and all the things. So we went to this place called the library. <laughs> and I, mean, I look up books and encyclopedias and just try to always learn as much as I could. And I did always wonder, well, what did women do at this time? And then I had read about, you know, Bell Boy. Um, I had read about, uh, you know, some of the women that were spies, um, some of the, uh, also a lot of women that would also travel with their, with their husbands and, uh, they would you know, help them out however they could. And then also, I, you know, then as I got older, I started reading the stories of the women that would hide their gender mm-hmm. and fight in the ranks. And to me, that was very inspiring because, I mean, they wanted to serve their country so much. They were willing to take that risk and go ahead and look beyond well, I'm not just going to stay home and cook and clean and, and drink tea. I'm going to go serve my country. <laughs> so uh, they, they were very inspiring to me at a young age, too. And over the years, I, I just learned as much as I could uh, when we were tossing around the idea of who to portray. You know, we had both, Randy and I had both said Pauline Cushman because she's not a traditional role. There are a couple of other folks that do portray Cushman that I'm aware of. Uh, I've seen them on Facebook. There's a woman in Ohio that does mostly her civilian role, but sometimes she does in the uniform, uh, not as much as I do. And then there's another woman who portrays Cushman in later life uh, out in Arizona. She does the civilian role. So, you know, we both said, I said, this would be a great opportunity. Um, and also, too, we wanted to introduce at events the side of the war that some people may not think of, and that's the intelligence, the military intelligence and the scouts and the spies and the cryptology and all of that fun stuff. So it was really a role that I think was meant to be. Um, and I am really blessed I get to portray her, if, mm. if that makes any sense. Absolutely. It does make a lot of sense. And then one thing I really appreciate, MJ, is that you are able to do this. And when you were touching on the fact that little girls feel like they have a place in the Civil War and that they have something they belong to, you know, as someone that's expecting a daughter here soon, I've always tried to figure out my approach to introducing the Civil War to her and how I'm going to get her to find some sort of interest that she can connect. What's going to be my tangible item I pass down to her? And the fact that you have something like this and that you have an ability to connect with them, I mean, bringing my daughter to you at some point is definitely something that I am 100% open to and wanting to do for sure. Sure. So that she can see this and be like, wow, this is something I can, you know, relate to. I can, I can be a part of this is awesome. And if that's something that brings, you know, that love of civil war to her just a little bit, awesome. You know, and that's not something she's ever into. That's cool too. But I really would like to at least give that attempt and find something that I could be like, Hey, this is a tangible thing that you can see and you can talk, you can talk to someone and find out what it was like for someone like you. 
Well, and that's great now, but I can't wait to meet her. Awesome. Um, I, I love dealing with the kids at events because they have some great questions. Absolutely. Too. Um, I did an event in October in Bedford and here I am up with, you know, we were, you know, I'm with folks portraying, uh, you know, general John Gibbon, general Meade, uh, we have General Hunt, we have Dr. Letterman, we have all of these different personas, and the kids just gravitated towards me because I'm a spy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, because they, they think that's a cool aspect of a, oh, it's a spy, you know? Right. Uh, so I love, I love dealing with the kids, and I also love messing with the kids, too, a little bit here because, <laughs> well, the funny thing is, is that when we're in – at our events, we're in 19th century. And, you know, that's also one thing I like about doing living history. I haven't touched upon, if I just may, for a second. Absolutely, please do. I like stepping back into the 19th century because, I mean, and, and I'll be honest with you, I, I grew up before all of the technology. There was no, um, you know, there was no internet. There was no instant, um, you know, cell phones. There was no anything like that. And... It's nice for me to step back into the 19th century for a few days at these events without technology because we, you know, we don't have our phones on us. We don't have anything like that. And we're in the 19th century. We actually sit down and engage people in conversations. It's to me, it's great. It really just, it, to me, it improves communication with everyone. We get to sit down and just have good conversations. We're not bothered by looking at our phones. You know, we're not worried about who's texting who and who's messaging this one. And so uh, when we're in care of these events, the kids will come up with their cell phones, either to get a picture or they want to show me something. I'll say, well, what is that? And the kids will say, it's a cell phone. And I said, well, what is it? And they'll get, and they said, well, it's a cell phone. I said, I don't know what that is. What is that? Is that a magic box you have? What is that? <laughs> That is great. <laughs> well, this one kid, he must have been about nine or ten. He finally got caught on to what I was doing. And he said, Major Cushman, ma'am, it is the descendant of your telegraph. Wow. wow. And I said, really? Let me see that. So I, I love interacting with the kids at these things because I do. I mess with them. I'd be like, what? What is that? I said, what, what is that? Or, or they're on their iPads or something mm. like that, or, or they're showing videos, or they're... I said, oh, and yes, and then they'll tell me about, oh, well, this is on Facebook. I go, what is the book of faces? What is that? <laughs> and, and, you know, and then the kids will be like, well, you didn't have, you don't have this? I said, well, no. And they said, well, how do you communicate? I said, well, I send a telegram. What do you all do? <laughs> And it, it's really a lot of fun. I, oh, that's absolutely. That's why I'm interacting with the kids. But I, like I said, I, I love doing living history because I get to step back into a time before all the instant communications and really just get to sit down and talk to people again and really build on those friendships and relationships. And it is it is definitely something else portraying somebody from the 19th century. And like you said, stepping back into time to feel like you – oh, man, I, I did a lot with an artillery crew for the National Park Service back – Oh, 2016, I believe. And we did a weekend at Chancellorsville where we had the cannon mounted up in Hazel Grove in Fairview. And I, I was able to sleep outside. And, you know, it was my first time ever doing living history like that. And, I mean, it was absolutely incredible and so surreal to be able to wake up on the battlefield. And that that was a moment I think I will always remember when it came down to something you mentioned earlier, but the sights, sounds, and smells of a, a memory like that. Mm -hmm. was waking up around, I mean, it was probably 4.15, 4.30 in the morning when we woke up. And the sunrise started. And it was just a purplish hue to the sky. And there was a fog gently covering Hazel Grove and the path out to Fairview, just underneath of where the cannon was. And, you know, I woke up under a limber chest. I decided to really slug it out and sleep underneath the limber chest that night. But just waking up and seeing that. And then off in the distance, there was um, a cavalry group camping out as well. So they were out early in the morning on horseback in that mist, in that fog. So when you wake up and you look down, that's what you see. It's really hard to believe you're actually in 2016. It For quite a few moments, I was expecting, you know, to look at a pocket watch and not have any of thing. It was back in the 1863, and it was just that, that feeling was surreal. Waking up to, to the guys next to us making 
uh, biscuits and gravy over a fire with some coffee that still had quite a few grounds in it after the last few sips. <laughs> Found that out too pretty quickly, but it was great. And I understand the feeling of that. It, nothing else in the world like it at all. Yeah, as a big Civil War, you know, geek myself, when I when I get to do that, it is, like you said, to me, it just brings it so close, the history. So, and the Civil War is really not that far away from us. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. And it really brings it to life for me. And then I think reenacting and living history is just so important, especially nowadays. To We need to right. bring history to life for not only kids, but also adults, too. I've, I've run I into some really good adults that have no clue about certain things. And they come to one of our programs and they and they learn something new. And I, I just try to also for, especially for kids, to make history cool. I mean, I, I was back in school and I always loved history, but there's a lot of kids that don't. They think it's boring because they might have a boring you know, professor or a teacher. And that's why I try to say, no, this stuff, you know, this is this is really cool stuff and it's really important for us to go out and, and i know that COVID has put a somewhat of a limitation on what we can do just due to a, vet, a lot of events being canceled and such but that's also to me it opened up a doorway you know like your podcast we're doing it online to outreach to people i do a lot of stuff i try to do stuff on facebook and uh and other things and zoom because I think we can outreach to people that may never have a chance to come to an event. Absolutely. And that's, that's, like you said, that's the whole drive of the podcast here is because we don't have the opportunity to be making it out to these places a lot right now because of COVID and, you know, just being able to reach out and make history cool. You touched on a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. And that's exactly what I try to aim at with this, you know, the video games and the Twitch and the podcast is because I don't want people to think that this stuff is boring because it really isn't. When you break it down and you can actually start realizing it's just, not right. And also, also too, like I've told people, because I work in the medical field here mm -hmm. in the 21st century, and a lot of folks will, they think that, you know, unfortunately the pandemic is brand, this is all brand new. And I said, no, why don't you go and read some of the history headlines from 1918? I just bought a book on that yesterday. Yes. Yeah. And when you actually, it, and, you know, someone had taken my advice and they started researching. They said, oh, my God, it's like reading headlines from today. I said, exactly. I said, so, you know, that's our history is always around us and, yep. and we're there to learn from it. And that's why, too, I tell people, I try to stay positive. We got through it back then 100 years ago. We're going to get through it again. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Because once we got through it, we had the roaring 20s. That's right. So we might have another roaring 20s. So <laughs> oh, oh, man. Major Cushman is ready, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is a conversation I can get. Oh, into. Tater, thank you. Welcome, jo thank you for joining the conversation. Um, now, with this, we have. Um, a I was thumbing through that book I was just telling you about yesterday. I was thumbing through it, and I look, and there were pictures of firemen wearing masks. There were pictures of regular civilians out at you know just grocery stores. Everybody had a mask on, and no. I was you know looking oh. at that. That was interesting. Well, they well, also had a, a lot of a lot of things with restrictions and things like that. And I don't want to deter too much off of the Civil War subject, but I think people really should research it more because they're going to see that there were even more things going on back then. The people were getting arrested. People were getting hauled out of places. And I just I just hope folks just to take a look back and and look at our history, and we can learn from it. And we can also know that things are going to be okay. Yeah, I, I think that's the case. I think it's going to, you know, look at, you know, just the patterns that history has given us before. Because history is cool, and that you know, that's why I try to say to folks that, you know, I have people that wanna, I have women that want to get into living history now because they came and saw one of my programs and they said, well, we'd like to do, you know, something about, you know, a non-traditional role and. To me, that's great. Or I have, like I said, I have the kids come up to me that they're inspired not only in, in Civil War history to get more involved, but also just in things in their life. You know, I had a teenage girl come up to me. Uh, we were talking for a while, her and her mom, at one of the events I did last year. And then they sent me an email a few weeks later that her daughter found the courage to 
handle a situation she was in and go to her parents because of my program to say, you know, you can do and be anything you want to be. Wow. Now that's and, powerful. And that's why I do it. It is a lot of work. I mean, and two, and, and one of my favorite questions at history events is, are you hot in that uniform? <laughs> You know, you're at Gettysburg and it's 95 degrees and 90% humidity. And uh, yeah, it's hot. I, I will stand out and do it because if I can touch one person uh, and, and with to inspire them or to get them to read, then I, that's why I do it. I don't do it. You know, there's that. I'm not making any money doing it, that definitely. But, uh, <laughs> and that's fine because just, honoring the names and stories of our past so they are never forgotten you know a lot of people i don't know if you've ever read the book by william chrisman on cushman i have not actually I'm, and i was hoping to get some suggestions from you during the podcast it's one of the today. best it's one of the best and i actually talked to the author a few weeks ago oh wow and um yeah we had a great conversation online and it's one of the best, but the funny thing is, is that one of my friends owns a uh, Civil War bookstore. And Could this be Civil War and more. It is indeed. Oh, please plug them. Go ahead and give them some, give them a shout out. Cause we definitely want to represent them here. If you all need some Civil War books, please see my friend Jim Schmick at Civil War and more. It's in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. He's available for in-store sales as well as over the phone. Is a Ooh. great a great location and jim is a great historian and the phenom phenomenal customer service he will treat you right an official bookstore of major pauline cushman so y'all better go there well if he has that <laughs> uh, that book you were just referencing i might have to give mr schmick a phone call well the and... funny thing is is that after i started portraying cushman a while and started her story started getting out more now he actually ended up selling out of the book oh wow ah, nice. Aha, that's good to hear <laughs> But yeah, and I was talking to the author and because he actually says, he goes, I know who you are. And I said, you do? And I'm like, oh gosh, what has he heard about me? <laughs> he says, you're the great Cushman. He goes, I wrote that book about 15 years ago. He goes, thank you because people are interested in it. And, um, you know, so that's why I think people do reenacting, they do living history. Ultimately, it's to share the stories of our past. If I can have Pauline's story here in the 21st century be relevant still, and her name will never be forgotten. And that's why we do it. Absolutely. I think. Um, to keep their memories For a lot alive. of reasons, but ultimately, to me, ultimately, it's so that their names and stories are never forgotten, because without them, we wouldn't be where we are today. We firmly agree with that. Absolutely. Now I have um, Wee Tam's in us with us today. He's actually our tech guy. He's the one that is the brains behind all of this. I like to think that I do a lot, but it really, without him, it, it wouldn't be done. I want to ask him a quick question, just about uh, the living history from an outsider's perspective, someone that's not really involved in the history field that comes to these events. Um, share some of your thoughts on what what living history is to you, and what you see when you come to an event with us. Uh, I haven't really been to an event with y'all. Um, I'd like to see how that is. Um, is it like some sort of reenactment? Well, that opens up a question, I think, for the major here. Uh, do you want to maybe explain what a living history event would look like when someone would show up to that? Please do. Cause... Well, how my, my organization does it, we set up... Uh, depending on the location, like over in Gettysburg, we set up an encampment over in Unity Park. We've got all of our our uh, tents up, and we have uh, we do have a spot. We have a big tent for where we give our programs. We every July we're there at least three or four days, and we provide programs on the hour. So we do hours upon hours of programming. Uh, either as a group or individual personas. So people can come into our camp. They can see what life was like back during the war. They can actually talk to General Meade and General Grant and my good self, Major Pauline Cushman, of course. <laughs> and, so they would come in. You can ask questions. Uh, many of us have displays set up. Uh, my friend who portrays Louisa May Alcott has period writing that 
that folks can try out um, of how to do the, the lovely writing back in the time. I'm going to be debuting about uh, all about the encryption of secret messages and using the cipher wheels on both sides. I'm going to cover both the Union and Confederate um, tactics for uh, it encoding messages and such so you can you know look at the cipher wheels and and each of us have a display you know general sickles has his display set up he has things for the kids where the kids can try on uniforms of the time so it's really like walking into a civil war encampment of that time and just talking to the persona asking questions uh, of course when you're in a place like gettysburg you do get questions on the battle and that's why i like to study the battle, even though Cushman was not at Gettysburg, people ask me questions about the battle, so I do have to be somewhat knowledgeable about it. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, we invite people to come over and talk to us, and you know, they will ask us too, why do we do what we do? And we'll step out of character, you know, we'll remove our hats and, and we tell them why. And each of us have, you know, personal reasons or such, but ultimately it's to keep their names and stories alive. So, if you come to a living history event, it's like you're stepping back into time. Uh, and I would encourage you to do so. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, I actually think I've been uh, to one of, well, not your event, but an event like that while I was in uh, elementary school, actually. Uh, it was interesting. Um, we got to do like all sorts of stuff, like washing clothes by hands. I, I don't know. Just interesting stuff about uh, history. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of hands on it. We try to do yeah. hands on activities. Yeah, a lot of hands on stuff. I mean, I enjoyed it. Um, I wouldn't say it got me interested in history, but because I was already interested in history. Uh, but it, it gave a lot of us an interesting like outlook on how life was like back then. I mean, and I'm glad to hear that, you know, from someone that go went to one of these, or maybe not ours in particular, or anything that we've done here on the Eastern Theater. But to hear yeah, that you guys yeah. do learn something from that, that's that's rewarding in itself. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, we definitely learned something. Good. That's good. I mean, I'm glad it's interesting, too. I think it's more interesting, and, you know, like we've said earlier, than sitting in a classroom and having that just instruction definitely. over and over and over again, the monotony of that, and being able to go out and have something hands-on and someone there that also maybe is very passionate about what they're teaching you. That, that changes the tone of how you're learning. It really does. Well, I agree with that, and and I've had some history teachers and professors from high from school and college over the years that they talk like this. Right, <laughs> there's no I, fun I, in that. I, I can attest to that. <laughs> a battle a lot of, people of Chancellorsville do. happened at. Um, <laughs> And, and, but then again, I have a friend who's a history teacher and he makes it fun. And, and, you know, it's all about presentation too. Like to do living history, um, you know, we're doing first person presentations. You do have to have public, you know, you have to be a good public speaker. Right. You have to have that knack for it. And sometimes, you know, it can be taught. Sometimes it can't be. I think you have to have a certain charisma about like, like the good Major Cushman just has a charisma and a charm that just <laughs> enchants everyone. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is, boys, is that when people actually get to meet me and I talk outside of character and I talk like this, they actually think I have a southern accent. Right. <laughs> and I said, no, actually not. Now, she was from Louisiana. She did a lot of acting, and she did a lot of, of her spy activities behind rebel lines in the South, so she never lost her Southern accent. So so when I was looking into portraying her, I said, well, gee, should I? she have a Southern accent? And I found through research that she did have one, so I, you know, <laughs> and I was very lucky that I'm able to go into that type of an accent. But a lot of people meet me, and they think I'm actually from the South. You know, they're like, well, we thought you had a Southern accent. I said, well, no, I don't, only when I want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think it's all about the presentation of history, and that's why it's so important what we're all doing, you know, what you guys are doing uh, what people are doing on, you know, groups on social media. I, I know the, the group that I run on Facebook, my main one is a great group of people that, and I make I it fun it's... too to learn. I do these trivia nights on Oh, oh no, I've no, seen, no, yep. No. No. 
Well, Michael Hardy over on Twitch um, chimed in as well. Thank you. Thank you for commenting. He says, Living History was my first introduction into History World, and that was almost 40 years ago. So see, even... Excellent. Yeah, we have even others that are just absolutely introduced by this, and this is what it does. And Michael Hardy, I think you actually do Living History as well, from what I've seen. Also the author of a very good book that I finished recently, uh, the was it the Branch Lane Brigade. I read that for some Fredericksburg stuff, and I man, I can't appreciate how much that helped that was awesome so i give you a shout out there and a thank you for writing that. my my boss named them my uh because i don't have a favorite brigade i i never irish brigade iron brigade stone or whatever my boss gave me the branch lane brigade because he knows i am not a big fan of stonewall jackson i think he's overrated so he said lane is your favorite brigade because they shot him i was like okay i'll take it oh, wow you don't like <laughs> general oh, jackson I think he's overrated. Stonewall. I will wow. take James Longstreet 10 times out of 10 over Jackson. Done. But I'll take Jackson over Yule and Hill. There you well, go. I should hope so. <laughs> All right, I'll we're talking D.H. Hill, Hill, right? Are we talking <laughs> D.H. Hill? Because we could, I, I am not a no, D.H. Hill fan. D.H. Hill was top-notch Excuse commander. Me? John D. H. Hill. Hill. Commander's Dan Sickles. We're going to have to have a discussion about that, Mr. <laughs> Ruse. Dan Sickles is awesome. I love I when I give my tours in Chancellorsville, I tell everybody when I get to Hazel Grove with them, think about what I'm about to tell you. Because most people that take my tours have been to Gettysburg and they're like, oh Sickles, he's nuts. What did he do? Uh, what I'm about to tell you now, think about what happens here in Chancellorsville, then think about what he did in Gettysburg. It makes a little bit more sense. That's very true, John. I'll agree with that. And, and two, what I tell people as well, if they ever get a chance to go to these battlefields, to walk the terrain, because if you are down where he was and you look up into the peach orchard, you can kind of see, and then, of course, going back to Chancellorsville, you can kind of see why he did the move he did. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It, At Hazel Grove. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a big thing. You know, you're talking about interest and everything. I call it a spark. I learned about the spark when I was an intern and just sparking people and having them say have those moments like, I never realized that. Before. Yeah, it's the you light know, bulb like, going off. In so your much, yeah, so much of the Civil War has been black and white. And I really think over the, especially with social media, a lot of the gray areas started to be found where there's a lot more to the story than, you know, oh, this happened. That's the result. That's it. No. There's so much more meat to it and uh, stuff like living history and meeting people like that, going to events, getting on the field is uh, huge, huge for uh, sparks and expanding the knowledge of the Civil War. I right. agree with that. And I portray Cushman, who was a spy. I prefer a scout because spy is just so scandalous and I've never been <laughs> a scandal, mind you. <laughs> uh, but uh, I... <laughs> Try to also tell the people about the like the Bureau of Military Intelligence during the war, and and we just actually read a book in my group's book club. Yes, we Spies, did. Scouts and Secrets of the Gettysburg Campaign, which a lot of people said they never ever would have picked up mm -mm. if we weren't reading it for book club. And I tell folks, you know, intelligence was a very integral part of the war. Yes, mm -hmm. and it gets them to see, and you know, it starts to click with them. Um, you know, and it makes them think too. Like the book was really interesting. I thought it was great, just because it told about all the behind the scenes stuff of everything that was going on. And people that read the book also, they never realized that the two cavalries clashed quite a bit. It wasn't just at Brandy Station, you know, before right. Gettysburg. They clashed, and then they also clashed on the retreat. And then a lot of people, well, you know, casual folks of interest. Okay, he loses at Gettysburg. Meade lets him. Meade lets him go back to Virginia. Okay, Meade didn't let him go back to Virginia. There's a nope. whole other story with that. And the some people folk. read the book, and of course, it covers the retreat uh, somewhat, and it really got people to thinking and also researching more of like, oh, well, that's why he didn't. You know, that's why he couldn't go after him because of the you know the days of pounding rain, or. or you know, there, there's just, like you said, there's so much more than just the stats and the statistics. Absolutely. Uh, so Now, with that in mind... Oh, go ahead. Go Sorry. Ahead. No, you're good. Continue. No, go ahead. All right. I was just, I was just saying that doing living history in that aspect to, um, you know, 
getting the people interested in a side of the war maybe they never knew existed too much and about the uh, secrecy and the uh, it's just so interesting you mm-hmm. know, with the signal core and the encryption and because when i started studying the confederate encryption of some of their messages it's so simple and i just said how do they not recognize this I right said, i said how do they capture a message and not re- i mean it was it was almost too simple and i think that's why it worked for the confederacy because it was just too obvious mm-hmm. and i think a lot of the union over overthought a lot of that uh, okay well, myself I but it's, it's an interesting that, aspect of the war and and but you know, doing living history has brought so much to my life, and I hope to expand on that, but also get people to think about other aspects of not only Gettysburg, but the other battles as well, or the other individuals. And when, you know, we were kidding around about Dan Sickles, and we said, well, nobody's <laughs> perfect. That's right. These were real people. I mean, you were. have to think about it at the time. They can't, you know, it's very easy for us to sit here in the 21st century and say, well, we would have did this, and well, we could have done that. And, and you know, but you're not actually in battle conditions. You're not on the field. You're not, you know, hiding behind a, a breastwork and see your best friend's head get shot off. Right. You know, there's just so much more to it. And really researching people of the war, realizing that they weren't perfect. Like, I'll, I'll be completely honest here. I really wasn't a big fan of Grant until recently. Mm-hmm. Um it was just because I really hadn't researched him too much. He was more, you know, like, and you get the usual things with him. Oh, he was a drunk. He did this. You know, he was that. And then I started researching him. And I started talking to the gentleman who portrays Grant in my group. And I really have a lot of respect for him since I learned more about him for a lot of the things he overcame in his life as well. And he wasn't perfect. Nobody is, you know. Not even Winfield Scott Hancock, John. <laughs> it's a perb ego. <clears throat> oh, don't you start. Got nothing to say about it. Hey, now, Hancock's a good guy. I just get on the bandwagon with driving you nuts. That's all. <laughs> that's why you get to marry favorite. Hancock is my favorite uh, union um, persona, I think. And just because he, you know, was just, he was a fighter. And he wasn't afraid of a fight. And, uh, you know, he had some, he had some things happen in his life, too. Um, you know, and then, of course, the friendship with him and Reynolds and Armistead. Armistead I have a lot of respect for just because of the things he went through in his life. He, t- he lost two wives. Mm-hmm. He lost some children. And, you know, just like Longstreet. Longstreet lost the children, you know, in the winter of 1862 to 63 there. Mm-hmm. He lost, I think, was it three or four of his kids? It was scarlet yeah. fever, right? You know, and, it, and that's yep. why it bothers me sometimes when people sit here in the 21st century and say, oh, I would have done this, that, and the other thing. It's like, you're not actually there. You're not experiencing their life. And doing living history, we hope to bring these people to life for people to try to understand them more as real people. Absolutely. And uh, one of the things I think I wanted to touch on, my last question for you about all of this, and I, I think it piggybacks off of all the living history and everything, but you know what? What feelings do you get when you're actually there on the field in living? Just like, what does that feel like to you as everything you've studied, everything you've read, it kind of culminates there when you're on the field and you're in the uniform and you're in the, the mindset of what you, you know, would perceive that Cushman was like, what does that give to you as a personal feeling? Well, when I got into living history, my mentor, he gave me, 1862 officers field guide Mm -hmm. and he said this is the first thing i want you to read and i said well cushman was never actually in the field you know she wore her uniform and uh you know introduced herself as major more she did lecturing starting in 1864 because she couldn't be a spy anymore she was outed and he says i don't care i want you to know like being an officer in the field So I had to learn all of that and learn all of the military 
stuff that goes behind it and how to be an officer. And it's really enriched my life, too, of how I look at things, how I conduct myself here in the 21st century. When I'm Cushman, and the thing is, is that Cushman and mine personality, we are so close in personality that I just feel that I, when I step into her role, I just play a heightened version of myself. It's not very easy, not very hard for me to go into her persona. I should say. <laughs> and it just brings me a sense of that I'm doing something positive. Mm-hmm. It brings the history to be on these fields where these people were and fought and bled for what you know their causes were. It just brings me peace too. Um, to feel that I'm doing something, I'm out there supporting and promoting our history, which again, right now is, is very, very important. And sometimes I feel I'm blessed. Mm-hmm. I'm blessed that this all worked out the way it did. And I sometimes feel, you know, that I'm expecting, you know, me to walk out of, of uh, Lydia Leister's house <laughs> or to see Longstreet and Lee riding along Seminary Ridge. You right. know, when you're on the field, it just brings it so to life for me. And it's incredible. And so, I sometimes think Cushman channels through me, honestly, sometimes because, um, you know, we are so close in personality. And then, mm-hmm. you know, what would Pauline do? <laughs> I sometimes <laughs> ask myself that. What would Pauline what do? What would Pauline do? And uh, like I said, she's helped me immensely in my personal life. And it's something that I wish I could tell her. Um, that, you know, you have given me courage. You have given me, you know, self-esteem that I didn't have before. I don't like to think in a way you are able to tell her by what you're doing, you know, with the living history and you keeping her, her story alive like that. That's the greatest gift you could ever give to somebody like that. And the fact that you're able to do that and that you take so much pride in doing that and you're very passionate about it, that says a lot about it. And I do think that would be a way of, you know, letting her know how much she means to you is by continuing to carry on her story and her traditions so that others can learn and experience that as well. I think it's very powerful. Like when I'm up on Culp's Hill, I feel a connection to my ancestors, you know, that, well, you know, they were here 150 some years ago and, and, and here I am now. So it, it just gives a great connection to our history and that I'm out doing something positive too. A lot of people will chitter chatter um, online and such, and they'll say this, that, and the other thing, but yet they're not out doing anything. Right. They're not. You know? They're just sitting on the sidelines where I said, well, I'm getting in the game and I will continue to be in the game too. I'm not detoured by anything. Like I said, I, we talked about a little bit of that flack that I mm-hmm. received, but overall it doesn't bother me. I just let it roll off my shoulders. That's um, what I like to hear. Just, to, yeah. just to, and Gettysburg is always, and it's weird because that battlefield in Antietam, I find they're my two favorite battlefields and I find a sense of peace when I'm on them. Now, of course, these are horrific settings, uh, you know, for these two battles in the mm-hmm. war that were some of our bloodiest days in our history. Um, you know, after I got out of my abusive marriage, I had to come to terms with, I have to offer forgiveness to this individual who doesn't deserve it. But if I don't do it, I'm not going to move on. Right. And I went to Gettysburg for a long weekend and just went out on the field and it brought me peace, and it brought me healing, and I was able to let it go, um, hmm. you know. But being out there in uniform, and and it, it's just so special to me. Um, I really think I can hear sometimes, you know, like I, I can really hear, you know, Hancock barking orders over on Cemetery Ridge, and and Hunt ordering the guns up, and, and things like that. So it sure. just it almost it almost separates. The veil between time and space. That's, Those that's the best do. way I can describe it. No, and I 100 percent relate to that. That's how I feel. I always tell people the battlefield does speak to you while you're out there, and you, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with that. I find that at Spotsylvania. I mean, and Gettysburg is exactly what you said. It's my one of my favorite places to go. I get that feeling almost every single time I find a spot on the field, and it might be a different location on the field every time that that happens. Mm-hmm. But there's always this one battlefield, and that's the bloody angle at Spotsylvania Courthouse. 
when I'm able to sit there and a lot of the times I get it to where I'm alone there. And that in itself is a different experience because at Gettysburg, you do have a lot of tourists out there, a lot of people coming to see the battlefield for the first time. So it's not often you get to have, and I'm sure you've had times where it's been, you know, solitude on the battlefield. And those are the ones I think are most powerful, but being at Spotsy and having that and just the wind blowing and that's all you're hearing. You might hear some of the wildlife and living near some of the farms in the area. A lot of the times you hear some of the farmers sighting their guns in and shooting some rounds just to, you know, target practice. But hearing even those faint pops while you're out there is it, it something else. There's, there's no real formulation of words I can have for that. Well, for Gettysburg, I advise people, cause I do a lot of battlefield photography. I will mm. get up early in the morning and yep do sunrise photography and and that's the thing if you want to experience like a little round top go early in the morning oh, when the sun's coming up because it is there's nobody up there it's absolutely quiet i sometimes sit up there just sit on the rocks and you know especially if you get a nice mist in the morning you know it's almost like you're seeing you know the smoke of the battle right uh, hmm. across the field and uh it's just something that you just sit there and, and you just, I take it all in. And, and yeah, there are a lot of tours depending on the battlefields and such. Uh, but I try to always find time to go out early in the morning, especially hopefully the weather cooperates. <laughs> you know, and that's a thing too. I used to go to Gettysburg as a tourist, you know, when I first started back in, the, you know, 2008, 2009. And now I go several times a year, but I'm there for events and I don't right. get a lot of field time anymore. Uh, so anytime I can get on the field, not in persona per se, uh, I value that. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely want to get down to uh, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania uh, at some point because I'd like to tour those fields as well. Oh, they're they're waiting. They're definitely here, and there's there's something else. And I'm re we're eager to get you down here to see these too, because I think they're gonna definitely have an impact. And we got a lot of them. We got four <laughs> big ones. We got Mine Run North. A I mean, it's endless. It's like an endless yeah. slew of some more. Culpepper. You got Brandy Station and um, uh, Cedar Mountain. <laughs> it's Petersburg, crazy. Richmond. Uh, everything is just in a stone store of each other. But I'm yeah. gonna head. Go ahead. I, I've been to Richmond. If I went, to, I went on the Swirlwind tour in 2015. I went to Richmond. I uh, went to uh, also to. I hit some of the other battlefields like Malvern Hill. I hit Ooh. Appomattox. Yep. I've never been to Malvern Hill. I gotta get to Malvern. Malvern Hill is sweet, man. I think you'll really <laughs> enjoy that one. It's it's yeah. very very interesting. Malvern Hill. At least that's one of the most memorable in my mind of battlefield visits between that one and Gaines's Mill. Gaines's Mill was another really interesting one to go to. If you've been to Gold Harbor, you've been to Gaines's Mill. If you've been to Gaines's Mill, yep. you've been to Gold Harbor. Absolutely. They're like right next to each other. They're, they're <laughs> 1862, each other. 1864, right, right next they're, to they're each other. They're the same thing. It's like going through Chancellorsville all over again, the Chancellorsville Wilderness ordeal. But to close yeah. this out tonight, uh, uh, two things I wanted to do. First off, we talked about a book club that uh, MJ had for her groups on Facebook that I really, really enjoyed and thought those were wonderful programs. So um, sort of inspired by that, I wanted to just touch on um, five books to me that I've read on the Gettysburg campaign that I just wanted to share with the podcast folks that are listening there that might want to find books to read and then ask them to name one or two books or maybe even five if they have five that they think are instrumental on Gettysburg. Um, but I'm going to start with the first one, which is not my favorite all time on an overview of Gettysburg, but it's one I want to recommend because I think it's a good starting point for folks that might not have a general overview of Gettysburg. And that's actually Steven Sears' book, Gettysburg. Uh, that one was a, a great introduction. I think it's packed with good information prior to Gettysburg and a little post Gettysburg information in here as well. So if you want a good starting point and a good reference point on Gettysburg, that is the one I would recommend to you there. Um, a lot of folks are interested in the human interest aspect, and one of the books that I cannot stress is good overall, not even just strictly to Gettysburg, but just overall human interest is actually Gettysburg's Unknown Soldier, The Life, Death, and Celebrity of Amos Humiston by Mark H. Dunkelman. That book is incredible. It goes into a lot of detail on the enlisted man experience at Gettysburg, being as he's the only one that bears a monument to the enlisted man at Gettysburg, I do believe he is the only enlisted soldier that has a monument to himself there. And that 
alone, the story behind why that monument's there and Amos' story alone is definitely worth a read. Third here is the one that MJ actually picked for the book club last week. I read that with them and it's like she said, it gave me a new appreciation for military intelligence and actually had me go and purchase the Major General George H. Sharp and the creation of American military intelligence in the Civil War. It's a very hefty price tag on that book and I was very happy to pay that because just the newfound interest in military intelligence when it came to the Civil War and I wanted to learn more. But the influence to that was Spies, Scouts, and Secrets in the Gettysburg Campaign by Thomas J. Ryan. If you can find that, definitely pick that one up. Second to last here, Too Much for Human Endurance, the George Spangler Farm Hospitals and the Battle of Gettysburg by Ronald D. Kirkwood. If you're into the the hospitals or a lot of the medical histories on the battle, this one again. I picked up after reading Gregory Coco's book, A Vast Sea of Misery. That was a very, very well done, and it kind of identified the hospital sites, and that one there was something I really enjoyed. Last and not least, Gettysburg's Peach Orchard, Longstreet Sickles, and the Bloody Fight for the Commanding Ground Along the Emmitsburg Road by James A. Hessler and Britt C. Eisenberg. I have an ancestor that fought in that engagement, so of course I'm a little biased when it came to wanting to read that, and that is also my favorite favorite section on the battlefield so again that biasness just kicks in and that was one of the first books i picked up here recently to read and 100 percent would recommend to you so that is my pile there i would like to turn it over to mj if she would have any recommendations on a gettysburg book to read or what would you recommend well definitely the fan series yes uh day one day two and then culp's hill and cemetery hill um Gettysburg Peach Orchard by Hessler and Eisenberg. I read it twice, actually. I read it once before, and then we did it for our book club. Okay. Um, I would also, uh, the Sears book as well, uh, which was, uh, like you said, a great overall introduction mm -hmm. to it. Uh, Gotta go with the Spies and Scouts book we just did. It was it was phenomenal. <clears throat> I learned so much that I didn't know about before and really gave me some good starting points to research other things. Um, and uh, I know that John's going to probably get upset with me on this one. <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, there's a book called Observing Hancock at Gettysburg <laughs> uh, by Paul Bretzer. It's, um, it's basically a lot of eyewitness accounts. Um, you know, Hancock came into the battle needing to really, and that's why his question <clears throat> is the way it is he's the calming hand of because when he came on the field in the afternoon of july 1st things were a lot in disarray for the union so um i would say uh that is uh, another one of my favorites um not only my favorite corps commander but on the battle as well all right and john do you have any recommendations on gettysburg reads before we close out tonight <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll go through mine really quick. Um, I'm a I'm I'm the type of guy that really likes the smaller stories. Um, and again, I talk a lot about the gray area, and you know, it's it's a lot of times Gettysburg does get caught up in this bubble, like many battles do, um, where it's like the armies come, the armies go, but they didn't just show up. A lot happened, so I actually kind of look at stuff outside of the three days. And because not only are you going to learn about maybe extra little engagements that happened, but how these armies kept progressing towards Pennsylvania and came on that collision course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, consider the pretty much opening engagement. You have Eric Witten, but this is part of the sesquicentennial series, Eric Wittenberg's The Battle of Brandy Station. There's also an emerging Civil War uh, book about Brandy Station, which I think Wittenberg did that one, too. He did with Don't Dan Davis. OK, yeah, there you go. And then there is, um, again, Whit Eric Wittenberg and Scott L. Mingus Sr., they did the Second Battle of Winchester. That's which on is, my shelf, uh, too. Yeah, which is basically Ewell's Second Corps clearing the field. They uh, did not, you know, have to worry about bad orders from Robert E. Lee. You know, take that town if practical. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was uh, another one about their movements going north. Uh, and then you also have another one by Scott Mingus, which I think is kind of cool. The Confederate Expedition to the Susquehanna River, Flames Beyond Gettysburg. Uh, definitely showing about Pennsylvania outside 
the realm again is June, set in June 1863. So you're kind of getting that idea. And then, um, again, as we kind of mentioned with the Spy Scouts, uh, the Spies and Scouts book, you have uh, Meet and Lee After Gettysburg by Jeffrey Hunt. Lee is Trapped and Must Be Taken, 11 Fateful Days After Gettysburg by Thomas J. Ryan and Richard Schaus. And once again, I think I kind of like Eric Wittenberg. Eric Wittenberg, J. David Petruzzi, and Michael Nugent, One Continuous Fight, The Retreat from Gettysburg. Always remember there's more to the story than just what you see there. There's a lot more to it. I concur. That was a lot of books. <laughs> and I, I want to thank you both for having me out here tonight. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, and I've been great talking with you, gentlemen. Absolutely. You're, you know, we all break chops on the Gettysburg group with the demerits and everything and Opie the Possum, but uh, hearing your story tonight, you are an inspiration, and that gift Absolutely. that uh, you feel that Cushman gave you to bring her to life, I think, honestly, you're going to bring a lot to life for a lot more younger ladies out there realizing they have a lot more to this story than, again, just the hoop skirt. Yeah, just the, that's absolutely the case. And again, we thank you so much for joining us on this program. And you are most welcome back anytime we have a new discussion. You would like to have any part of the discussion, please feel free, and we will let you in here and talk away because this has been oh, great. Well, well, thank you so kindly. Of I course, do appreciate that. Jamie. We want to have a platform for all of us to get on. If we have something we want to talk about, and it's you know, whether it's history related, civil war related, what have it, we would just love to be able to throw an episode up at random and just talk away and it'll be you know able to be pulled back up on youtube spotify apple music all of those platforms have us on there so you can listen to this at your leisure whenever and we, we just like having the discussion and letting other people hear the discussions that happen among the history fields some you know the behind the scenes stuff sometimes i think it's great for that to be out there as well and just a community for all of us to come together and chat with whether it be facebook or youtube or whatever but again it's been great i really enjoyed this and i think i'm like i said it's completely appreciative of you guys coming on here and joining us for these topics and these conversations definitely definitely been a lot of fun it has well everyone uh you guys have a wonderful week we are at the end of our weekend here in the beginning of a new week so let's have a good one and we look forward to seeing you guys back here soon um if you it just want to hang out in discord i'll be back in in just a few moments i'm going to close the thing out if you just want to have any closing remarks while we're offline but uh. So I, I, I don't know. I'm pretty good. Just uh, good. if anybody's listening from the Gettysburg group, don't forget it is Monument Monday. That's ooh, that's, that's right. right. That's right. <laughs> I have to dig through some of my photo archives tomorrow and find some stuff because I have I need to pull through a lot of Gettysburg stuff actually. But all right, guys, y'all have a wonderful week. All right. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Have a great night, y'all. Good night. <laughs>